earlier this year, the Democrats and the liberal media created this mythological war against women when George Stephanopoulos of ABC News asked Governor Mitt Romney in one of the primary presidential debates about whether a state should have the right to uh, legislate a woman's access to contraception. You know, Governor Romney responded very appropriately that no one was even thinking about that, talking about that, or anything else. But the media picked up on that and just really ran with it and has created this myth that somehow there's a war on women. Today we're with Debbie Georgiatis, former uh, Dallas County Republican Party Vice Chair and author of a, a new book called Ladies, Can We Talk? And Debbie, I'm, I'm surprised that you're not wearing a combat helmet and, <laughs> and fatigues and, you know, aren't you aware that we're at war with you? <laughs> I hadn't heard a thing about the, that war until George Stephanopoulos let us all know about that. No, I do not think there is a war on women, at least as he, what he means by that. Yeah, it, it really was surprising. Uh, Governor Romney looked shocked when that question came out and, and uh, you know, they, they just took off and ran with it. You've written a book now talking to women about conservative issues and, and bringing forward ways of, of talking about that. What prompted you to write this book? You know, it's kind of a combination of three things. Um, one is that I think America is in the middle of kind of an identity crisis about whether we want to be the America of our founding, basic freedom, um, or do we want to capitulate to what I perceive as the Democrat Party's track or trend right now, which is to grow the size and power of federal government so we end up with more of a government-controlled economy and a government-controlled society. So I think we have an identity crisis, what kind of country do you want to be? The second thing that occurred to me as I it prompted me to write the book was really looking at how women tend to vote. I think women like freedom, but women tend to vote Democrat more than Republican, and I felt troubled by that. I don't think that women today would want the outcome the Democrat Party is offering America, uh, even though they're voting, many of them are voting with the Democrat Party. So I was looking at that factor. And the third one is just kind of a more personal one, which is women tend to talk so my, more than men. So my goal was to inspire women to really take a fresh look at the facts. Where is America today? What are the two parties offering us? What kind of future do we really want? Because I think most women want the future of the founding freedoms of our country, a government limited by the Constitution, and they want the freedom that the free markets and free enterprise system bring. They want the, 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 um, the prosperity, the uh, strength of the country that can only come from freedom. So I decided to write about inspiring them to look at the facts, and then once women are on board, I encourage women to be talking more about America, about what kind of future they want. And by talking about America, you're not talking about waving the flag and the red, white, and blue bunting and all of that patriotic type of thing, but really important day-to-day -day issues and, and the impact that people, that the government has on people in their daily lives. Yes, in fact, that ties back to your question earlier about the war on women. Part of the discussion that has occurred as a result of that little media interaction is that, for example, the H under Obamacare, or the federal health care takeover, HHS has a mandate that insurers provide women certain forms of health care related reproduction, uh, birth control, health care related to female care, uh, completely free of charge to women, that they're not, insurance companies are not to provide, uh, not to require a co-pay or a deductible. So they're in, in essence mandating insurance companies provide free health care to women. And I think that number one, that creates or it, it advances the idea that women are dependent on government. That, you know, and once that happens and women go for a decade or so, and then we decide, gee, this is really expensive. Insurance companies cannot afford to keep giving free care. And then we try to change that regulation. We'll have the argument that women are being picked on, but really, there's no reason insurance companies should be forced to provide anyone free health care. And the Democrats took that issue, that was really about whether, under the uh, federal health care takeover, HHS should mandate insurance companies give free things to women, and argue if you don't support that, that that constituted a war on women. And it's just it's insulting women's intelligence. 
When I first met you a couple of years ago, you had coined a phrase, the supermassive blue hole, referring to uh, some of the inner city communities where they've been under Democrat control for decades. And this kind of infuriated uh, some of the people on CNN and the Huffington Post. But tell us a little bit about what you meant by that phrase. When it tends to be in America that the Democrat Party stands more for uh, bigger government, higher taxes, and trying to provide more free things to people. And the net outcome of that, in fact, it wasn't really, it wasn't my research, I was just reporting on some research about the uh, top 10 cities in America that have the highest level of poverty. And these are the big cities, the highest level of poverty. What they all have in common is long-term Democrat government. Democrat mayors, Democrat city councils, and ultimately Democrat policies that create poverty. The point is that Democrat policies, maybe even they sound nice and they're intended to help people, but they create poverty. And that's true both in this one study I mentioned earlier, this, these massive blue holes. I, I mentioned Detroit, but there are other big cities that are similarly experiencing high poverty rates, also high crime rates, high dropout rates from high school. It all stems from a philosophy of government that is government attempting, perhaps to give the kindest interpretation, attempting to help, but ultimately creating a citizenry dependent on government and not, and not inspired to, to achieve and to, um, and to become self-reliant. And actually recently there was another similar finding in 2010, after our elections, we had some states have Republican governors take over and some states had Democrat governors. And a study after that that occurred this year showed that the states that chose Republican governors did much better in terms of improving their employment picture. That Republican-led states, Republican conservative policies, led to a lower unemployment rate and those states that chose Democrat government had either had an employment rate that stayed as bad as the national average or only improved as well as the national average did. Republican policies did better at creating jobs and reducing unemployment. Now when you coined that phrase and picked on the city of Detroit, Anderson Cooper and Rachel Maddow both really got outraged about that. And so what that tells me is that there's a lot of truth in what you said and it struck a nerve and they felt like they had to retaliate back against you. What we've seen since uh, President Obama came into office is there are more people on welfare now, more people on food stamps now than we've ever had in the history of our country. Uh, today, some figures came out that we're spending a trillion dollars a year on poverty, and yet poverty is increasing. It seems like we would almost be better off if we just took that trillion dollars and wrote checks to people instead of funding all these bureaucratic processes. What impact does that have particularly on women and single mothers? You know, I want to start by mentioning about the um, money spent on the social programs. The, backing up just a bit, we began the Great Society in 1960, the War on Poverty under uh, Lyndon B. Johnson, and since that time we have transferred 16 trillion dollars from the private sector, from taxpayers, to, over to these social programs that try to help people. And I am the first to say, I think that most people who, and women voters who vote Democrat because of those kind of programs have the kindest and, and most noble intentions. Mm -hmm. But after we spent $16 trillion in the last 40 years, we have more poverty in absolute numbers, more poverty in percentages than before. So it's just a, an approach that hasn't worked to actually heal poverty. And on the subject of women and children, I think that, you know, the compassion that inspires a lot of women to vote to support those programs, we ought to take a look at what is the really most compassionate thing for children in those communities. Because many studies have shown that the breakdown in the American family has paralleled the growth of the social programs. And really all that means is that people who, they're the impact of programs that pay you uh, with respect, because you're uh, living in an impoverished condition, the outcome has been families break down, the father figure, which is in many cases the, the wage earner, is no longer on the scene, and children suffer. And there are, there's just a lot of data out there 
that tracks the growth of welfare with the breakdown of the family. And then, uh, on top of that, it's just not that the family has broken down, but that children suffer in those families. That the children, there are statistics, and I'm, I will not pretend I'm great at memorizing numbers because I'm not, but there are many, many studies that look at this, that with children who grew up in single parent homes uh, tend to be more likely to drop out of high school, become, uh, uh, become, get arrested, have trouble with drugs, alcohol, end up in jail. They're just, it's not, and you know, there are many wonderful single parents who end up in that situation through no fault of their own, and God bless them, they do a wonderful job. But as, as a society, when we decide how to help people best, we should look at what's the real impact on families and on children of these massive government programs. And I think, on, in net out, it has harmed them. Sometimes the media has, has uh, created this perception that Republicans are uncaring, that they're harsh, um, that the rhetoric is is not sensitive or compassionate. And sometimes we do that to ourselves in the way we talk about things. One of the things that I liked about your book was there's a lot of real meat and um, solid information in here, but there's also sections of the book where you talk about how to convey that information and how to do it in a more conversational way, in a non-confrontational kind of way. Tell us a little bit about that. I'd be happy to. I want to mention one thing, uh, which your question alluded to. There are also, I mention studies a lot, I do, I do read a lot, I love to read research and understand what people looked at, and one area of research that I mention, in fact, quote quite a bit in the book, has to do with charity in America, and who really are the people who are donating to charity, donating time and money and efforts, even donating blood, because I think that there is in the conservative conservative approach in life, um, a kind of consistent overall thing, which is conservatives tend to not support um, large government spending programs, but they do support charity. And the one book I mentioned in there, and I met the author and told him I think he did a fabulous job, uh, the author is Arthur Brooks, and his book is called Who Really Cares? He's actually written many books, but this book, Who Really Cares, is a big study about what kind of charity in America really have, what was the truth about charity, who helps, how's to help, and, and you know, I encourage people to read that book too, but the, to, the summary of it is that um, the people who tend to do the most charity, the most giving of time, money, donating blood, are conservatives, people with religious background, people who are Republican, people who oppose the redistribution of wealth. So it's a really important factual context to recognize that while I know the popular media picture is that Republicans are being unkind if they don't support large spending programs, really the way they live their lives, they're far more generous than those who have a more liberal outlook on America. Even when you adjust for um, income level, in fact there are the average Democrat household in America actually has a slightly higher average income level than the average Republican-led household, but it's Republicans who donate far and away much, much more than the Democrats do. So I think it's a, it's a factual context to keep in mind about who's really, well, what really is, is the best way to be compassionate. I think personal charity has many attributes to it that, are, that make it more effective and make, it, make us more whole or bonded as a society. And that's not a new trend either. Um, about 20 years ago, I was in the business of working with nonprofit organizations and their fundraising activities. And at that time, the trend of Republican donations to charitable organizations versus Democrat contributions to philanthropic organizations was way out of skew. Mm -hmm. You can look at examples of even President Clinton and President Obama and their level of contribution. Uh, President Clinton writing off donating his underwear, <laughs> literally, to uh, to That's not my book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But um, you know. There has been this long trend because Republicans believe in charitable giving and, and through philanthropy because it's a more efficient way of delivering social services than the government is. Yes, and I mentioned it makes a more bonded society. You know, when, when you are donating your time and your money at a food bank or charity, you're, you're in person, you're connecting with other people in society. And the recipients see you and you see them and they feel a, a connectedness to society. It's a very much more, um, 
I use the word bonding thing for society, but it makes us feel it's a more connecting thing for our society. And I think it helps both the donors have a genuine awareness, a more personal awareness of the struggles others have, and helps those who are the recipients to uh, feel more connected and part of society and recognizing others here care and they want to help us. What's your favorite chapter in this book? Oh, chapter 11. And <laughs> it's, it's, it's you didn't even pause on that, okay. No, it's the chapter, it's actually, I call it the, I believe it's called the Julia, it refers to the ads that are on um, our current Democrat president's website that are encouraging women to vote Democrat. And it actually ties in well with what we were talking about a moment ago about uh, large social spending. The chapter, chapter 11 is directly speaking to women and it, it points out that currently in 2012, our Democrat president's re-election campaign website has as its main pitch to women a fictional character, they name her Julia, and the entire pitch to women is, vote for Democrats, we'll give you more free stuff. That's how you can summarize it. It, it lists, starting age three, up through age, I believe it's 67, all the free things Democrats will give you. And that's the enticement to women to say, and I, to, to my sense, it is, it's denigrating to women to this notion that we can, we'll buy your votes with goodies we give you. The other thing is, it really lulls or it attempts to lull women into joining the dependency class, and joining the class who thinks, I can't really function without government. I need government to provide me all sorts of things that for most of human history, people understood they had to provide for themselves. And the other thing that really strikes me about it is, you know, feminism is not a popular word right now. I actually read, read a recent study that said even most women don't like that term anymore. But whatever term you use, women worked hard to get equal rights in America. We worked hard to have, we had the Equal Pay Act in 1963, we have the Title VII laws that say, so we said we have laws that say you have to pay women uh, same pay for similar, not even just same work, but similar work. We have laws that prevent discrimination in the employment. We have laws that prevent discrimination in education. We work so hard to be on actual equal footing with men in terms of competing in the work, working world and education. And so, and part of that, what prompted that was women prior to that time, you were really dependent on your husband or your dad to function in life. If you became widowed or you're on your own, women didn't have equal rights to make their own way in life. So we, we women, um, broadly speaking, fought for those rights. We, we obtained them legally. And it seems like what the Democrats are doing to appeal to women is 180 degrees opposite of what we fought for. We fought to be equal, to have equal rights, and now what the Democrats are saying is, you women, you really can't make it on your own. We better make some special rules for you. You're going to have free health care, or at least portions of your health care. We're going to force insurance companies to give you for free. It's insulting. It's also, it assumes that women don't have any economic intelligence, because we that old adage about nothing is free or there is no free lunch, well, even if the insurance companies are forced to give you certain health care for free, it's not really free. Someone's paying for it. And in the case of the insurance companies, they're not going to just give away that benefit and choose to lose money. They're going to spread around the loss from that, what they're forced to give for free, to other Americans who pay higher premiums, higher deductibles. They're somehow going to adjust for it. And so to make the pitch to women, on the Democrat side, here, look at all the goodies we're giving you, it's very insulting to women's economic intelligence. It's interesting, the, the way the media plays this war against women, uh, they went ballistic this year when Congressman Aiken in Missouri made his uh, unfortunate comment about women and legitimate rape. Um, certainly wasn't what he meant to say, but it was a, one of those things that you say on camera when the words just don't quite make it out the way they're supposed to. And yet, in Harris County, in Houston, we have a Democrat who's running for district attorney, wants to be the chief prosecutor in one of the largest district attorney's offices in the nation, where he would be responsible for prosecuting crimes of domestic violence. Yeah. And he literally said, in a debate with his Republican opponent about domestic violence, that some women just like to be beat up before making love. 
and the media virtually ignored that statement. They did. You could barely find it in the news anymore. And, you know, I um, Todd Aiken's comments were unfortunate. And I'm, I'm very sorry he said those things because I actually don't think that's what he meant. Mm -hmm. But whatever it is he meant, the media willingness to assume that anyone on the right, the Republican or conservative side, is insensitive to women's issues, and therefore any statement that is inappropriate, and his was inappropriate, I'm not excusing it, but any statement like that is to be repeated in the news, is grounds for just, he ought to, and there were demands from the left, he should withdraw immediately, he shouldn't be a candidate anymore, uh, just, just an extreme overreaction, and he was not in any way justifying or encouraging violence against women, unlike the gentleman in Harris County who is wanting to be in charge of deciding whether to prosecute men and legitimizing, in, in fact, implying women some women, at least, he's saying, seem to, he would say, like to be the recipients of violence. And so, you know, the, the media, the juxtaposition is, is outrageous. And I actually saw there's an, um, an email flying around now, maybe you've seen it, I don't know, but it has a lot of very funny comparisons. I mean, funny, except they're really sad for America, but funny comparisons between uh, the way Republicans or conservatives versus Democrats or liberals are treated in the media on a whole host of issues. You know, just one little one was you know, Romney was, he's always, you know, the extremely rich uh, Romney or some other denigrating, even more denigrating term, and, and he earned his money mm -hmm. versus, for example, John Kerry, who married money twice, and every time he's mentioned, he's almost a war hero. I mean, the, the media rarely calls attention to his wealth or how he got it. And um, I, well, there is actually a section in the book I mentioned, I think it's in, I forgot which chapter it's in, I think maybe chapter three, but it's about how much the media manipulates the vote. Mm -hmm. And I um, have talked about, I have uh, 12 universal truths that politicians use to trick voters. And I don't mean just women, but they are, and, and, and in addition to that, I talk about the media and how if you don't think there's media bias in America, um, that you're just not even really paying attention. There's a UCLA study that I mentioned in detail, and I would say throughout the book, footnotes right in the middle, and in the UCLA study, they actually, and the UCLA is, you know, no conservative bastion by a long shot. They are liberal themselves. And the overwhelming conclusion they came to is that there's just an extreme left-wing bias in American media. They run through the major newspapers, you would imagine, the major television networks, and it was a very comprehensive study. So I included that just to say, if all you ever do is read the Washington Post, you don't really have the news. I mean, the, the internet's full of news sources. Try reading both sides. Read stuff on the other side to figure out what's really going on. Well, we certainly want to encourage people to read this book before they go out and vote. Early voting starts uh, next week in Texas. Yes, it it's already begun in many states across the nation. Where can people get a hold of this book and, and uh, get it in their hands so they can become informed about some of these issues? Thank you for asking. It is on my website, which is ladieskenwetalk.org. It's also available on Amazon and will soon be available in Barnes & Noble. And, but my website, ladieskenwetalk.org, has actually, a, not only the order of the book there, but you can see some tapes of friends of mine talking about the book, talking about, um, I've been very active politically, so kind of talking about political activity. And um, I am going to be uploading, one thing the book has I wanted to mention, if I may, is near the end of every chapter, or most chapters, I have a little did you know section. And I'm actually, and they're just little conversation starters because the did you know sections have just facts and they're ways to share things with people when you're trying to share your political ideas. I'm in the process of embellishing those. I'm going to load them onto the website. And so this goes back to a question earlier, which I didn't, I guess, really answer, which was about making conversation with people about politics. Mm -hmm. And I do want to uh, mention that, which is, you know, it's, it can be hard to talk about politics. Everybody has a relative or a friend that you just know better than to raise politics because you don't agree and you've had maybe some tender conversations. But I think there's too much of that in America, too much just deference to silence or deference to political correctness. And so part of what I'm encouraging is read enough so you're comfortable defending what you think. And then when you have the opportunity and, and you encounter someone who does not agree with you politically, Go ahead and have a conversation. It doesn't have to be a confrontational one. You can start, for example, with just asking questions. I've used this technique with friends recently where 
um, one, talk, one friend was talking about her um, strong support of gun control laws. And I'm not, I'm, I've never even touched a gun in my whole life. I'm not, I'm not a gun person, but I support the Second Amendment. So I just said, to her, well, did you know about the studies that show that when they impose gun control laws, actually uh, crime is, gets worse. And when you have conceal and carry laws, where you're permitted to kill, conceal and carry, gun crime goes down. And she never heard of such a thing. And I did the same thing with someone who was advocating for raising taxes on the rich. And I said, well, do you know about the Laffer curve? Which is an economist, Laffer, who wrote about the notion that when you raise tax rates, revenues go down to the government. And this woman was a lawyer, and she said, there's no way that could be true. I said, look it up. I mean, encourage your friends to do some looking, ask questions. The other thing, um, in terms of sharing conservative ideas, is the notion that if you can do it through stories and real life examples instead of statistics, mm -hmm. I think sometimes people remember those more later. And um, there are a lot of stories in the book. I interviewed different women who uh, actually came to America from other countries where they lived under socialism, they lived under communism, they lived under oppressive government, and they are very insightful about the, as I started out talking at the start of this, the direction the two parties are offering our country. They see more clear, clearly than a lot of Americans what path the left is taking in America today, which is to grow the size, power, and control of the federal government over society and over our economy. People who lived under that, under that kind of repressive system recognize the language, they recognize the attitude of the American left, and they're more alert than we are, really, to what, what may be in store for us if we don't hang on to our fundamental freedoms. Well, Debbie, thank you for inviting us into your home once again here, and it's always great to see you here in Dallas. I'd like to encourage everyone to go to Debbie's website, ladieskanwetalk.org, and, and get a copy of this book and, uh, and become more informed and more involved in, in your daily lives and in politics. Thank you very much. Thank you.